Companies spend billions of dollars every year on AI and analytics, but what's the value? How should you articulate that to business sponsors? Check out this episode of Future Proof to find out as host Eric Cavanaugh interviews David Sweener, Nick Jewell, and Sean Rogers. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet, today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yes, indeed, folks. Welcome to the future. Back to the future, right? Uh, here we are in 2023, hurtling forward. Uh, I think the quickening has already happened because things are going really, really fast these days. What do they say? The days are long, but the weeks are short. And uh, we're already knocking on the door of halfway through 2023. I, I'm not sure I believe it, but here we are. And folks, we have an all-star cast for you today. Thanks to our good friend, David Sweener, who uh, decided to rally some troops and get a whole group of evangelists together. So we've got David Sweener, Sean Rogers, and Nick Jewell, an all-star cast of analytics and uh, AI experts. We're going to talk about the business value, defining the business value of analytics and AI. Well, it's a much different story now than it was five and 10 years ago. Pretty much everyone understands in the business world that analytics is really important. How you get there, what you do with it, how quickly you leverage the power of analysis, that's a different story. A lot of uh, companies are doing real-time optimizations now using analytics and AI. We're gonna talk about artificial intelligence as well, which is an interesting sidetrack. In many cases, it tries to do the same things that analytics does. And ideally, you want to kind of blend these two worlds and get the value of AI for pattern recognition, pattern matching, for understanding what's going on in complex scenarios. And then, of course, analytics, running the numbers, understanding why that's happening. Really, if you get these two together, you can get a really clear picture of what's going on in your business. And that's going to help you regardless. So it's, it's very good to have these technologies uh, exactly which ones you choose will depend upon your budget of course and uh, your use case but these folks know a lot about all that stuff so david Swainer, since it was your idea i'll hand it off to you to to kick us off here what do you think the business value is of analytics and ai and uh, what do you do to evangelize all that well eric hey thank you for having us on uh, totally appreciate it and you know i thought of this topic you know a lot of the clients and, and prospects we talk to um, organizations have made a significant investment in data. And so we've, we've done a great job of ingesting, collecting and storing data. And you've know, spent, you know, millions and millions of dollars on these things, you know, companies have. But when you get to the analytics side of it, it doesn't have the rigor. Um, the number one question hmm. that I get is how do we measure that value? How do we measure the ROI? Um, most of the clients and customers that, that I, I speak with anyways, they don't know how to articulate that beyond personal productivity. So we saved some time. They don't know how to tie it back to specific business KPIs. And so, you know, I thought it would be great to have uh, Nick Jewell and Sean Rogers here and to discuss this topic. It's uh, it's, uh, it's at the top of minds for, for all the, the clients I, I speak with. Yeah, and Nick Jewell, I think we'll bring you in Next, you've been doing this for a long time and you have your own company as well. And we should point out that David has a whole book series, Tiny Guides, I think he calls them. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But uh, you also have your own enterprise where you're trying to educate people about the value of analytics, right? Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I get, I get to Moonlight as the co-founder of a really cool little analytics upskilling startup that we call datacurious.ai. We were teaching thousands of students across the world, you know, the benefits of analytics automation and really data literacy to reach their goals. And we'll dive into this more, I'm sure, during the conversation today. I just wanted to throw out there to start with, um, one of my highlights of my career was getting to interview Billy Bean, who was the general manager over at the Oakland A's, the baseball team, mm -hmm. um, made famous by not being Brad Pitt, obviously, uh, in the movie Moneyball. And the, the idea of value in that film was all about trying to find cheap baseball players that could get on base really easily. If you got on base, you scored runs, you had a good chance to win the game. Hmm. So I think when we talk about finding value in, in analytics and AI, we can turn back to those ideas of big data, maybe from a decade ago, the big data Vs. You're not going to find value in volume anymore. I think the cloud service providers have probably got that one sewn up. 
you're probably not going to find it in variety necessarily anymore. A lot of work that I've done over the last couple of years with um, one of the more niche players in the analytics space, a company called Incorta, is really starting to build out the concept of a data lake house that gives us so much more flexibility than maybe we saw from traditional data warehouses. But later on in the conversation, I'd love to dive into the topic of that other V, the idea of velocity. I think there's a lot of room for differentiation in that area. Mm -hmm. Velocity, volume, variety, these are the, the three V's that they talked about. And veracity is a fourth V that came into the equation. Uh, that's not something that ChatGPT is too good at. Uh, Sean Rogers will bring you in on that. It's good at lots of things, but the veracity, eh, not so much. I wanted to be the first person to say ChatGPT. <laughs> I, I thought there was a surprise involved. Um, uh. But, you know, I, I think right now we're at, we're at an interesting inflection point. Right now, it feels to me like it did when the internet arrived for the public, for the consumers, for uh, mass adoption. And suddenly uh, things like generative AI are, are in the public eye. And I, I was, I mentioned in the pre-call, my family had a wedding this weekend. I had two people ask me about ChatGBT. Uh, they were not the normal persona I expected to hear from on that topic. Uh, and it's always interesting uh, to see what we all know collectively as not a brand new technology. AI has been around for decades, uh, but it is really, uh, you know, gaining some interesting traction. The public stuff is great. I think the more interesting things are happening in the enterprise, uh, and and I agree with, uh, you know, what you know, Nick just said a moment ago about velocity. How fast can you make a decision? How accurate is the decision you're making? Can you automate that decision? Um, and then there's architectural challenges. Can you move that decision outside of your uh, IT data center? And can you get it on a device to make a decision? Can you get it out to the edge of your business world and so on? So I, there's a countless topics for us to discuss here, but uh, it is kind of fun. And it has that feeling that definitely reminds me of all of the disruption when the world discovered the internet, which had been around for a while. Uh, as we all know, but it was this brand new thing in the 90s where everybody thought this was this classic brand new toy. I just feel like I see the same thing with uh, with AI and especially large language models and generative and so on. So yeah, it'll be a fun topic to explore. Yeah, and the, the costs have really come down now. That's partially because of open source technology. It's partially because of the cloud. It's partially because of a company called Amazon that really baked into their corporate DNA this trajectory of bringing costs down over time. That was never a thing before that I recall. I mean, people would lower the cost of things as commodities became more prevalent, but the fact that they really baked that into their approach and their mission, I'll throw it to David Swainer first, I think that's one of the reasons why costs have really come down and the cloud has become such a, a prevalent force in our lives these days. What do you think, David? Yeah, you know, I think that cost, um, you know, piece is, is very interesting to me. And, you know, to, to mention something that, you know, to, Sean had said, you know, this 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 waste that's in, in the analytics process. And I think this is where companies can tie this back to ROI. If I look at an analytics process, it starts, you have some sort of business event. You need to prepare the data to get it analytics ready. You have to complete the analysis. You need to make a business decision and then you need to take business action. And if you look across that spectrum, there's data latency, there's analytics latency, there's decision latency, and there's action latency. Mm -hmm. so I think these things, you know, that if you can compress this cycle, that's where companies are gonna get that that value. So that's that, um, uh, I think there, there's a lot to be learned that if you just take sort of a process approach to this, it's not just doing analytics for the sake of analytics, you have to take that business event and tie it to business action. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that. And, you know, we talk about big events. We've had lots of disruptions in the last few years. We had, uh, it really started in the previous administration here in the States with tariffs on China, which no one had ever done before like that. And that threw the supply chains off. And then of course, COVID comes around as a huge disruption. And that really made us focus on, I think the power of analytics, because we also had to really focus on workflows and processes and, and how to get to data and how to do things and a lot of people figured out hey man we we have to change how we're doing things we have to take sort of an api first strategy maybe whether it's security or just network connectivity or remote working all that stuff kind of just threw the apple cart sideways and uh, i think we learned a lot from that nick jewel what do you think 
Well, absolutely. I mean, I'm not sure how it affected you folks over in the US, but that big tanker that blocked up the Suez Canal made everybody panic over here, certainly in Europe, because the supply chains broke. We realized we didn't have that resilience across the board. So putting in data programs, analytics programs, getting to AI programs so that you could start to suggest alternate routes, alternate mm -hmm. suppliers, ask more of those what if questions, more sophisticated analytics became priority number one. So I think over the last few years, obviously the large shock of COVID has, has made data and analytics forefront in the minds of the public, the media, governments around the world. But I think that real-time element, when things like supply chains get threatened, is such an opportunity for more advanced analytics to enter our lives in a beneficial way. Yeah, and I think the AI really comes in, machine learning comes in handy with things like supply chain, because a traditional relational database, you can get some analysis of product amounts and locations and things, but you really kind of need more of a graph technology and you need some AI to be able to run all sorts of different simulations. All right, what if we do this? What if we do that? What are the costs going to be? You know, in the old days, 20 years ago, you would just kind of think about it and take your best shot. I mean, you might have some decent software you're using. SaaS, of course, has been doing cool stuff for a long time, SAS out of Cary, North Carolina. But Sean Rogers, I'll throw it over to you. I think what Nick is talking about, these disruptions really led to a keen focus on different ways of solving problems. And I think that led to a boom in AI and machine learning. What do you think? Well, I, I think it was certainly a cause of it, but we've, we've seen this a couple of times when these big disruptions come along. For those that we've all been in this business a long time, the financial dip that we saw in 07, 08 mm -hmm. uh, disrupted data, changed data for companies. And then of course the chain reaction on up changed the analytics. Uh, the big ones that we're talking about now. Um, I have asked numerous customers, you know, especially in the executive ranks, how dramatically did your data change in March of 2020? And you don't get a clear answer because mm. everyone was so busy trying to fight the higher level issues of how do we shift our marketing messages? What words don't we use? Do we want to invest here or there? Uh, a lot of companies uh, didn't notice how dramatically things were evolving and changing quickly. Mm. And supply chain is a great example. E-commerce is another one. Uh, the big companies that quote unquote did so well during COVID were not as prepared as they probably should have been. You guys remember early days, Zoom struggled uh, as they were growing. There was growing pains with other companies that were filling these gaps. And so understanding the dynamics of your data and how you're applying AI to it, models that worked on March 1st did not work on March 31st. They yeah. were they were not performing at the level they needed to. And so that takes you to some of these other big topics that I, I'm hoping we'll touch on, like model ops and data ops and and how do you how do you bring it up to that next level and and provide the scale that's required, but also the operational scale that's required. Mm. Uh, so that you can be nimble and so on. So yeah, I you know these big disruptors, even you know natural things, right? Uh, natural catastrophes and so on, uh, shift data all over the place and then affect models and affect the interaction of those models. So yeah, yeah and we really we'll, we'll talk about uh, automation too. And you know automation is something that uh, is always helpful if you do it correctly. You have to be careful about what you automate because you can automate a crap process and then get a really crappy process and get very unhappy customers. I mean, I've seen this stuff happen and marketing automation is hard. I was talking to a guy who's been in the industry for a long time and uh, he told me, because we were talking about HubSpot, I think, and I just said, from my experience, it is really hard to map out multi-touch strategies using even something like HubSpot because of so many exceptions. There are so many cases where someone's gonna go outside that perceived decision tree and the automation is gonna fail when that happens. So you have to think through all these little bits and pieces and it's hard. And he said, yeah, it's taken us about a year. Yeah. So you got a team together, it takes a year. I mean, these days, like, well, it takes a year. What are you building a data warehouse there? Well, that's what he told me how long it used to take to build data warehouses. But the point is that it's hard, but you still have to do it. I mean, automation is gonna be a crucial success factor, whether that's for data ingest, data cleansing, data provisioning or whatever, all along that value chain, you wanna be automating whatever you can.
folks, take us to the future where ChatGPT doesn't hallucinate. That'll be good. I love that they came up with that term, hallucinations. That's pretty funny. It will make stuff up, folks. And basically, ChatGPT is a large language model. It's a predictive engine. It's designed to predict the words that it thinks you want to hear based upon the prompt you give it. But I wanted to get back to uh, this whole concept of speed and, and, and what has to be real time and what doesn't have to be real time. And someone who knows a lot about that is Sean Rogers. So Sean from Bark these days, Bark Research, tell us about this uh, collision of value. Well, you know, it's this idea of, you know, not everything has to be real time or right time. It, I think all too often we get distracted by our ability to do cool things. And then we think that it has to be applied to everything we're doing. <laughs> and, and I think like the big data phenomenon kind of taught us that. We started off with everybody has to have Hadoop. My Hadoop has to be bigger than your Hadoop. And I would like a purple Hadoop because my competitors have a blue one. <laughs> and, and they tried to do everything in it and then they quickly found out that it's applicable to certain workloads and i think the same thing happens here around the value of ai and the value of automation you've got to apply it to the right circumstance the white the correct workloads a, a friend of mine dr richard hackathorn has published an awful lot of work on this for many years about the intersection of where the value is and the timing of a decision if the, if the timing is too long, you miss that value window. And you gave a great example of that a minute ago, call center interactivity and thing of that, uh, things of that nature. It's all about bringing the decision and the time it takes to make that decision to the highest value point. And it's not for everything you do, but now there's new strategies, moving your analytics to the data instead of the data to the analytics. Those types of finesse sophistication strategies are allowing companies to meet that mark and it's especially important around new th you know like modern data stacks that nick just you know we've agreed or they can be kind of fragile um mm -hmm. so you can't try to do it for everything do it for the right stuff and then make sure you're hitting that target of time and value yeah, well, that's a great point, right? Make sure you're hitting the target. You always want to be focused on the business value and the use cases really matter. And there are lots of use cases for AI these days. You know, healthcare is a really big one. And population health, for example, can be really aided by being able to analyze data at scale. I'm actually talking to uh, the chief analytics officer from uh, CBS. She's going to speak at an event with me for Reuters in November. And she was talking about how they're using AI and analytics to be able to do sentiment analysis across thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of comments on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and places where people do throw their opinions into the pool. Well, I mean, they're fun to read sometimes, but to get meaningful value out of them, that takes some pretty serious text analytics work to identify the word clouds, identify the cohorts, who are these different people, what are the demographics we care about. But she's telling me that they are intently focused on that day after day after day. And that's a pretty interesting use case in and of itself. Nick Jewell, what do you think about that or some other good use cases for AI? Well, absolutely. I was just, my mind was drawing back to some work I did a couple of years ago with the PATH organization out of San Francisco, which does a lot of work with the Gates Foundation to sort of, you know, try and spread as much um, goodwill as they possibly can with the combination of data and boots on the ground to actually solve problems like eradicating malaria. Another really simple example in this area was during COVID, governments were trying to give aid to the most needy people in those countries. And one great example is a program called Nevesi, which was out of Togo, a very small country, um, you know, over in Oceania. And basically, they wanted to give out aid. They really struggled to work out who needed the aid the most. They didn't have a really good socioeconomic uh, registry across the country. So as we were talking about earlier, they took really interesting sources of data, IoT data. They took hmm. satellite images. They took mobile phone metadata, the information about the calls rather than the calls themselves to actually identify the poorest geographic regions, the poorest mobile subscribers based on their behavior and could actually target the groups that were most at risk. And they actually managed to hit the 29% most poorest economic groups in that country as a result of using these modern data sources with advanced machine learning models in ways they just couldn't have dreamed of just a few years before. Wow. And you know, you brought up something that I think is absolutely fascinating. Maybe I'll bring David to comment on it. And then Sean, is this wealth of information sources that we have these days, IoT in particular, is so powerful because you can track things and you can understand the movement of people, of 
of uh, objects in a factory, for example, even footfall to be expected at shopping malls based upon the traffic in coming into the city that morning. These are real use cases that some very forward thinking companies have now put into play. And that can be very, very compelling because now we're leveraging what I call real world data at scale. And uh, I think we're still in the the uh, period of time of trying to reconcile what we thought was the case with what we're now seeing is the case. But David Swinner, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, we're all walking IoT devices these days. You know, yeah, that's right. Cell phones and they're in our car. You know, it brings up an interesting question to me, though, is, you know, who owns this data? Are there concerns about privacy? and security and you know what is that limit you know we, we've certainly seen that big tech companies uh they're not going to police themselves i think you know even you know google had written that in their original research paper if, if you're motivated by by profit that sort of always wins right and so now we got all these ads so i appreciate the value of having all this data i am a little concerned on sort of who owns it who controls it you know in that classic who watches the watchman yeah. How do you, how do you, um, you know, I would love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Maybe Sean Rogers, quiz custodian at Ipsos Custodes. <laughs> Who watches David, the watchers? David knows, David knows this in, uh, in the last book I wrote, I have a chapter called Innovative or Icky. And, <laughs> and it was an entire chapter about, you know, how far is too far? How far, you know, when does insight and helpfulness or automated AI start to make you feel a little uncomfortable. And the weird thing is, or maybe not weird, it's a different threshold for everyone. All mm -hmm. of us feel differently. I have expectations and I want AI to help me do things. I want uh, Amazon to tell me what shirt to buy with whatever slacks I just got. I wanna know what other people ordered when they went to that restaurant. I want all of those things. Some people don't care for that. And so I think one of the balances uh, to David's point about privacy and so on is going to be how we're going to find what works for the majority and, and giving controls to the others to limit uh, their interaction. But I think just as the internet disrupted many years ago or the World Wide Web as we were talking during the uh, commercial, um, it exposed this great technology that existed a long time ago. So I think there's going to be uh, acceptance and rejection on these types of uh, interactions. And it will also depend upon uh, the theater you're in, right? If I'm in a business environment, I have an expectation that a BI tool is going to use AI to augment the view of the things that I'm doing. And I may not have that same level of expectation with my sports, favorite sports website. So, you know, I don't, I don't know, guys, does that make sense? I mean, do you see this collision of innovation, innovative and icky coming? Yeah, ab absolutely, Sean. I think, I think for me, this is something I've been watching for a couple of years as I watched Jeff Bezos get closer and closer to William Shatner's orbit, you know, sending him into space, <laughs> doing all that cool stuff. William Shatner has been sitting down with Amazon and basically pouring his heart and soul into a model right now so that when he dies, you'll be able to talk to William Shatner. How close do we get to Icky when you can do that with your mother, grandmother, a significant other? That won't be that far away, right? It'll be David Sweener as a service and we'll be able to call and tap in on his expertise. But ser <laughs> seriously, though, on this... We, we are talking about, I think, the need for, for privacy and ethics, but also synthetic data. I think when it comes to these niche, very sensitive areas where we do have privacy issues, healthcare data, finance data, we need to be investing more in topics like synthetic data production to be able to train these models on domain areas rather than necessarily just harvesting everyone's data for that purpose. So I got an expansion for you on this one, Nick. I'm not sure you would have seen it on TV where you live. Uh, uh, the CEO of OpenAI was in front of our Congress a week or so ago trying to teach all the 75-year-old senators what AI is, which is should have been billed as a comedy show. But they did use a piece in that where uh, the setup for part of the conversation was supposed to be one of the senators speaking and his lips weren't moving and the words were coming. And it was a very eloquent paragraph of text, and it was it was AI voice uh, copying, and so the AI was speaking in the senator's voice. Wow! And, and it went into the record here in Congress as AI gave testimony, kind of made a statement. So you know, wow, 
where does that go? I think the senator did it because the AI was a lot more eloquent about AI than he was going to be. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, it's it's the synthetic idea of synthetic data and, and AI, um, you know, copying people's voices. I mean, there's gonna there's gonna have to be some guardrails here pretty soon. So this, this brings up an interesting question, though, Sean. So you know. The U.S. has always sort of been behind, you know, where Nick lives in the world in terms of regulations on, on AI and privacy. Now, if we if we step back, we say, OK, Europe has this sort of regulations. The U.S. has this sort of regulations. China, who knows what China is going to do? They have their own regulations. So is there a, like like what is that balance? Like if we're really strict over here, not strict here and you're do, doing something totally weird over here you know I, i'm curious about you know your thoughts on that you you Obviously. highlighted the balance right it's the extremes of both are going to be curtailing and the the inside lane would whatever that is i i had the privilege david when you and i worked together years ago i was uh i was at uh, at the eu and i got to have a conversation i uh, gave a talk there about would would the strict governance over ai and big data limit the ability for the EU to actually keep pace with crazy countries like the US who were not really doing any uh, guardrails at that point. And it was an interesting debate. And I can tell you, I had that, that conversation in 2016. I wrote the chapter in my book about innovative Ariki in 2017. And we're not there yet. And then when something like ChatGBT shows up in the public market and is being adopted by college kids to do their homework and and everybody else in kind of odd ways it's just opening up i think it's going to be a forcing factor david right it's gonna it's gonna make us find the guardrails and it's going to make us identify that inner spot because both ends of it probably aren't the way to go yeah no these are really interesting points too and nick i was talking to a guy from england he runs an organization called the data city and they're doing some really cool stuff around transparency. And I'm pretty sure Sean knows about my my evangelism in the era of transparency or in, the, in this uh, in for transparency in federal spending, but also in corporate transparency. And he was telling me that in England, if you have over a million pounds a year of revenue, you have to open your books, whether you're a public company or not. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I mean, I really like this focus on, especially again, as AI starts taking off and getting a life of its own and being able to imitate people extremely well, we need transparency and we need trusted voices and trusted channels to be able to deliver trusted information. What do you think, Nick? Well, absolutely. So I, I've done some work with a data science charity in the UK called Data Kind, and we did a big hackathon all around exactly what you said. A company called Open Corporates opened the books and all the different companies that were based out of the UK, based out of the various um, you know, communities in the islands around the UK. Jersey is a tax haven, for example, Bermuda and other areas like that. And we crawled that data looking for patterns. But without that transparency, none of that machine learning would have been possible. We built an amazing graph database that allowed us to capture who was opening opening serial companies day after day? Why were they doing that? We had a whole team of data journalists just to look into the things that the model produced. So transparency leads to some amazing benefits. But if I may, one, one last point around just the general concept of bias inside these models. Yeah. Um, myself and my co-founder a couple of months ago, just as GPT was really hitting the, the hype cycle, we did some frivolous tests and we were like, tell me a joke about the Irish. GPT would give you a joke. Tell me a joke about the Polish. No problem at all. Give me a joke about the Chinese. I'm sorry, I'm an AI model. I can't do that. And there were yeah. certain countries where it was forbidden. And it was really interesting to see. Guardrails are obviously in place, but they're not applied consistently. 